Okay, there we go. We have a winner. Um, yeah. Um, I didn't just pick that, pick that message last night out of a hat. I felt really compelled by God to do that here for a, a lot of reasons. I don't need to get into all of them. Um, but one of the reasons was because it was the first time I was going to meet all of you all. And I thought it would be good not just for us to connect individually with God, commune with God, have intimacy with God, because that's what we're doing when we take communion. We're being intimate with Him and His life, but so that there could be a, a level of intimacy between all of us doing that together, right? Coming together. And so um, that was very, very nice. Um, while I was praying up there tonight, I was thinking about the word fornication again. Do you remember which word it, it was yeah. in that verse? Yeah. Okay, just so everybody can know, and I don't have to go into it. <laughs> oh, oh, why, why? Is that a cuss word? It can be. Right? It can be. <laughs> well, the reason why Paul called it fornication, he wasn't talking about physically, he was talking about spiritually. The reason he called it fornication and not just intimacy with the idols when he talked about idolatry is because God is supposed to be our husband. And we, we use that word in a spiritual sense because it's describing that we were made to be intimate with God. Right. And so if you're being intimate with someone other than your husband, it would be called fornication. Right. And so that's why Paul used the word fornication, because they were now being intimate with a God other than God. And they were having intimacy with that life. And that was producing fruit in it. So when we take communion, we're communing with God. Um, and through that intimacy, he gives birth to his life in us. Just like, um, you know, when a, a man and a woman come together and they're intimate with one another and they, they're sharing their heart together and they're becoming one flesh. What comes forth out of that? Children, right? This dear sister back here, she's going to give birth to a child. That's the fruit of intimacy, right? Of, of the two becoming one. And so communion, you're engaging in this intimacy with God that out of that comes forth his life by his doing. Right? And it's really that simple. We just are connecting with God, and out of that connection with God and that connection with what it means to be one with Him in His life, what comes forth from that is His life. And since one of the ways we know God is Father, that's, one of, that's how He fathers His life in us, which is what He's after. Right? He wants to father His life in you, not so He can be happy with you and like you, but because He thinks, man, it feels really good to be Him. It feels real nice this life that he has in himself. And he wants you to be able to experience it with him so you and him can talk about it, right? And be like, that's awesome. You know, when you go do things, you don't typically like to go by yourself. I'm kind of strange. I can go by myself and just have a good time. Um, sometimes I have to travel without my wife and I'm sitting in a restaurant by myself eating. I'm not by myself because God's there. But most of the time when we have an experience that we really are happy and excited about, we want somebody else to have experienced it with us. And then we're talking about how great it was. Wasn't that great? Right? You ever been to a concert or a show that, man, you got goosebumps, it gave you a buzz, and you're talking about it with the people you went home with, or if no one was there, you're telling your friends about it, right? Man, it was so awesome. You should have been there. That's what God's feeling inside of himself. He has a life inside of himself, and it, it's so beautiful to him. It, it, it's so full of joy that he wants to be able to experience that and share it with somebody else that can feel exactly what he's feeling, and then they can walk around and talk about it, right? How wonderful it is. So that's when we think about, because so many times we can think about our lives in the sense of behavior, and we could think about God wants us to behave, and we think that's the end goal, for us to behave. God's after so much more for your life than you can behave right. That's not even what he's thinking right? What he's thinking is, is he wants you to be able to, to feel his peace with him. He wants you to be able to feel his joy with him. He wants you to be able to feel his love with him. And out of you being filled with those things, yeah, you'll be put to rest. You'll have a sound mind and you won't be acting out as much, right? You won't find some of the, the fruit you don't like coming out of your life, but that doesn't mean that's God's end goal. Right. You're 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 way more valuable to God than um, him trying to get you to behave right. And the, the 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 correction of God, 
you know, the author of Hebrews said that God doesn't correct us in the same way our earthly parents correct us. I love my earthly parents. They're great people. They really are. And I don't mean to say this negatively about them, but my earthly parents are not God. And despite the love they felt for me, despite how much they wanted to always get it right, there were times where they corrected me because they felt frustrated. They were times where what was coming out of me was making them feel like they didn't have the peace they need. And so they would correct me to try to get peace, right? And so the correction in that instance was for their benefit, not mine. You see, God's not trying to correct you so he can have peace, right? He's not looking at your behavior thinking that he's got a big problem with your behavior and that you're keeping him from joy and peace, and now he's going to correct you so he can feel better. Right? All of his correction is always with the intent that you could experience peace on the inside. That's the only thing he's after. He's not a self-serving God. He's a self-sacrificing God. And we see it really portrayed on the cross where he even comes and sacrifices himself. He provides himself as the lamb just so we could be set free from fear and death and be filled with love and joy. Okay, So you want to keep this in mind in your relationship with God as you're walking in the earth with God, that everything he does is for your benefit, not for his own benefit. He's not trying to like you more, okay? If you took a person who was acting out and throwing a temper tantrum every day, if they're taking a moment to have a fit every day, and you have another person who's never throwing a fit ever, that's always just walking around, you know, calm and full of love, and you put them both before God, God's not liking the one that's calm and full of love more than he's liking the one that's throwing a fit every day. He's not feeling frustrated with the one who's throwing a fit every day. He's not feeling a certain kind of way about them that they're somehow less than the one that's calm and full of love. And we want to remember that in our lives with God because there's, um, there's also a spirit in the earth, a word that hasn't come from God that really works to try to accuse us in our hearts when we see things in our lives that we don't think are right. And it, it doesn't just accuse us in the sense of um, we can see that it's not God that's accusing us. It tries to get it right to where we think it's God that's accusing us, or we think it's God that's dissatisfied with us, or that God is discontent with our lives and what we're doing, and he's just really disappointed. You ever had, I'm really disappointed in you, you know? <laughs> that's not the voice of God. That I'm really disappointed in you is not the voice of God. That's not how he talks, right? That's not what he's thinking about. That would be as if he was trying to get life from you. And now whether he can feel good about himself as a parent is if you can act right. God's not trying to feel good about himself by getting you to act right. He's not an insecure parent right? He's not walking around, am I good or am I bad? And looking at you to try to get an idea if he's doing good or if he's doing bad. So he's not feeling frustrated or disappointed should he find you in the place where you're throwing a fit. We have this uh, uh, music band in the States that I used to listen to as a kid when I was rowdy. Um, it, it's called 311. And the, the guy had a, uh, uh, a lyric in the song that said, uh, just take a moment to have a fit once in a while. I do it daily. I like it, but that's my style, right? And so if you're in the place where you're taking a moment to have a fit daily, God's not scowling at you or frowning at you or thinking that, why won't they clean up their act, right? You know, sometimes when we see somebody struggling with something and it's not going good with them and we feel like we've told them or we've helped them, and it's not working out yet, we can have a tendency as humans to be fickle and think they just don't want it. God's never thinking they just don't want it because he's not judging people after the flesh and he's filled with all patience and temperance. And so he sees that there can be layers in the heart and he sees there can be barriers that have to be um, relaxed and have to be comforted and massaged to where he can get down to the root of the issue. So just keep that in mind in your life with God, because we can get so impatient with ourselves, right? We can be so hard on ourselves, 
And John says something about the heart, that if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. And people come with all these different interpretations that really misses the context there. God's never condemning us. That's absolutely right. But if our heart is condemning us, we think God is too. And that's what John's saying, right? And we do it in our lives with people. If we feel a certain way about ourselves, we can immediately assume the people around us are also feeling that kind of a way about us. We transpose our own beliefs about ourselves onto the people around us, and then we interact with them as if they're thinking the same thing about us that we're thinking. And they're not. They're not. Listen, most people are just trying to survive. I mean, they're wrapped up in trying to think about their own life and just getting through the day, right? They're not sitting around feeling about you the same way that you're feeling about you because no one's harder on you than you. And one of the reasons you're hard on you is because the serpent is in the earth accusing, right? And he's accusing you specifically. I know when I was a little boy, I'm an intense person. Like, I'm a passionate person. So I'm like, mm. like I, I feel. We call it, I feel the feels, right? When I feel something, it's like animates my whole being. And so I was an intense person. I played on the playground harder than everybody else. I played the games harder than anybody else. And they had to sit me out of recess because they said I was too intense for the other kids, right? Well, in that place, I made a judgment about myself that I'm too much, right? Well, without knowing it, because I was a little child, I went through life transposing that belief on everybody else. And I just assumed everybody else also believed that way about me. And there's a whole bunch of people that never thought that ever, right? And then you, you go through life judging people's hearts, right? and judging the, the intents of their hearts based on how you feel about yourself. And it, it can shape your relationships in a negative way, and it can cause you to be offended with people when there's really no reason to be offended with them at all. Really, you're the one that's offended with you. You don't need to be set free from other people's judgments about you. Other people's judgments only bother you if you've already judged yourself. And even should a person have come and said to me, you're too intense, Greg, you're too much, that never would have bothered me if I hadn't already decided it's bad. I wouldn't have even cared. So we're not trying to be set free from other people's judgments. We're trying to be set free from our own judgments about ourselves, right? And so don't allow your own judgments about yourself to taint what you think about how God sees you or how God might judge what he sees going on. And at least let that serve as a distinguishing mark right now. That if you feel this way about yourself, it is not a sign that God's also feeling that way, right? And don't read your beliefs about your situation into God, right? And allow the Holy Spirit to plant that into your heart. Well, that's a certain kind of a dynamic because every single one of us have, have lived in this earth and every single one of us have heard words or thoughts or testimonies about ourselves from different events, different circumstances, different people in our lives, people we were close to, we've heard things about ourselves. And some of those things have tried to shape our thoughts about ourselves, right? So that we view ourselves in that way, and then we assume other people view us in that way also, right? So just try and keep that in mind as you, you walk around in the earth. And something that I've done is I recognized I had judged myself a certain way. And I had judged that it's not good, right? The second the teacher, I mean, I was like 10 years old. The second the teacher come in and was like, you're too intense. All the kids love you. And now that I think about it, I'm like, well, if they all love me, then why is my intensity a problem? <laughs> now that I think about it, it but, but you're too much for the other kids. And then she pointed at how I did everything. And it was easy for me to see that I did things that way. And immediately I judged that it was evil that I was that way. And then I went through life, right? Walking around, judging everything through that filter in my heart, right? Walking away from hanging out with people, having a good time, and then later on, you ever hang out with people and then go away later and think, oh my gosh, how was I? Right? Where you start getting in your head about what did they think about you and what you said and what you did, right? And it comes in and tries to rob all this peace and joy from you. That was me. I would walk away and I'd be like, oh, man, I was so excited. Was I yelling? Was my arms flapping around? Oh, no. 
right? And then immediately I would, and you know what that ended up doing to me, right? We, we talk about being introverts and extroverts. God never said that about anybody. I'm just telling you. God never said anybody's an introvert. He never said anybody is an extrovert. But do you know what happened to me is I took on very introverted tendencies because I felt so much pain at what I thought about myself and what other people must also think about me. So then I, or I just wouldn't go around them anymore, right? And the world would come and say, oh, you're just an introvert. No, I'm not. When has God said that about anyone? That doesn't mean you have to go out there and try to be with people. But don't allow something to come and place a label on you, right? Because then it becomes an identifying marker that shapes your life, right? So maybe right now you could feel some social anxiety. That doesn't mean you're an introvert, right? And don't allow the label to come on you. And don't try to force yourself to be around people, but just start talking with God, right? And if you feel a certain kind of way when you're off with people or when you come back from being with people, just talk to God. Now I feel this certain kind of judgment, accusation that tries to come against my heart. Right? I don't know what it is. If, if you think I need to know, you can tell me. Otherwise, I'm available for you to be working in my heart behind the scenes and healing that. Because I'd rather just go and be around people and when I come back, just feel like it was a good time. I'd rather when I'm around people, not feel like I'm awkward. You know what I'm saying? Right? Because the only person feeling like you're awkward is you. <laughs> right? No one else is feeling that way. And you might hear the voice of God say to you, who told you you're awkward? Who told you you're an introvert? And all of us sitting here in here today are believing something about ourselves. All of us. The way we are, the way we function. I'm just this way. Have any of you ever said that? This is just how I am. Okay, well, listen, you might stop in your time with God later and think, well, who told me that? Who told me I'm that way? that I'm just like that. Did God come and tell me that? I promise you God didn't come and sit down with you and tell you that. So then where did it come from? Right? And you might just, you know, you don't have to analyze it and get, you know, think about it for a long period of time, but you might just hear the voice of God saying that to you. Who told you? Right? And let those judgments be plucked out of your heart about yourself to where you can start living free from those judgments. Right? And you, you could start enjoying yourself instead of feeling a certain way about yourself, right? Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and I'm, like Gwen and I were talking about that God proved his qualifications to be our God when we were dying at the hands of, of sin and death, how he came into the earth and took it into himself so that he could stand in the gap, so to speak, if we want to use that kind of religious language, and rebuke the death that was destroying us. God came into the earth and bullied the death that was bullying us. Well, that proves how qualified he is to be the one who serves us with life and protects us. Because we see he loves our lives so much that he even came into the earth and rather take our death into himself than let us die. Well, listen, that's the kind of person that can be my God the kind of person that will prefer my life over their own, that would rather die themselves than let me die, that are so concerned with giving my life care that they will even come into the earth in war against the thing that's trying to destroy me. Now, I'm not trying to believe in God. I find something in my heart that just can't deny that he's my God. You can't deny that they're your God when you've been presented with that type of evidence, right? Well, I'm uniquely qualified to talk to you about not making judgments about yourself and to hear the voice of, who told you? Because my life was destroyed for many years from that judgment that you're too intense. You're too much for people, right? And it shaped my life for a lot of years. And I saw evidence that looked like it corroborated what I believed. And so I'm just too much for people. I'm just too intense. Look at me. Even when we first started the church, even sometimes today, I move on quickly, but if I'm being honest, sometimes when I get very excited, I go back and look at the video, and I'm like, my goodness, Lord. It looks like I'm about to take flight. I'm about to hover up into the air. I mean, I can see tracers on my arms, Lord. Can, can I just like, can they just go down? But then I get a good laugh about it now. So you might think you have compelling evidence, 
But just, I promise you, God wants to say to you, who told you? Like he said to me, who told you you're too intense, Greg? Who told you you're too much for people? And he says that to bring out in the open that it wasn't him. And if it wasn't him, why would you be grabbing onto it and saying it's true? Right? Does that make sense? Because we do that in a lot of areas. I had another mantra from my life, King of Pain. There's a police song called The King of Pain. King of Pain, I will always be King of Pain. Now imagine singing that in your heart every day. I will always be King of Pain, right? And I had this idea, that's why I ran so much, because I had this idea that I can suffer more than everybody else. Who wants to suffer more than everybody else? That's not a nice thing, right? So just let the voice of God come in. Who told you, right? Does that make some sense? All of us have that. Because the world has tried to come and give a word about all of, all of our lives. All of us. And God also come into the earth to give us a word about our lives. And the only one who has any authority to speak any word about our life and who and what we are is God. And any other word we do not want to receive into the garden of our hearts. Right? Because it could be planted into the soil in our heart and it can bring forth or try to bring forth a crop that we don't like. <clears throat> Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Uh, I don't want to. Okay, this is my water right here. You know, I love I love talking with John. He 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 tells stories, you know, and his stories are about he likes history, right? And history excites him, and so he he he's telling the the history and telling history is a story, and people like to hear stories about what's happened in the past, right? We derive a certain type of. Uh, understanding. It makes us feel like we understand things when we hear a story, right? All of us, we get to know each other by telling each other our story, right? Isn't it? You all know something more about me just now than you knew before. And it helps you to know me better that I shared with you a, a story about my life. And now that I just gave you guys the ability to look into my heart. Right. And to see a piece of me that's deep inside and something I went through, something I felt. And I, I, I showed you the things I grappled with. And through doing that, we have more intimacy and you know me better. Right. I'm more real to you now. I'm not just some preacher guy. Right. Now, oh, I, I know that guy. Right. That's Greg. And now, you know, something about my life. And it's like that with all of us. Every one of us today could give a story about something in our life and what it's the equivalent of is us plopping our heart out on the table and letting everybody see into it and in everybody seeing into it we can have closeness and intimacy and we can really know one another right we can know what hurts one another we can know what makes one another happy we can know what fills each other with love and joy and then we can partake with each other in that kind of a thing well listen god also has a story about his life Right. And I don't think we normally think about that. God has a story about his life, that, that God has felt things in his heart, that God has experienced certain things. And that in knowing the story of God's life, we can get to know God so much better. Right. First, John says that uh, nobody had seen the father, but the son, he was in his bosom. He has come into the earth to bring him out of the darkness so we can see him clearly. So then in seeing him clearly, knowing his story clearly, we could really understand and know God and experience him by being able to see into his heart. Right. There's a, a famous uh, <clears throat> reverend, um, not just reverend, but a public figure in the United States, and I got to imagine the world, Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. right? I have a dream, mm -hmm. right? Well, God also had a dream. Mm -hmm. God also has a dream. The only reason why we could even have a dream is because he first has a dream. We're in his image, okay? So tonight we want to talk about the story of God's life mm -hmm. so that in hearing things he's thought, things he's gone through, we'll be able to know God so much better because we have these natural eyes. And sometimes we're struggling to see God, right? And we think he's intangible. How can anyone know God, right? And the way you can know God is by him telling you his story. And in the scriptures, God is telling his story. 
And you have to want to know his story to see it, but it's there. And it's actually a beautiful story. And you can actually really get to know God to the point where you see this guy has the most tender heart of anybody I've ever met or talked to. This guy is so tender for me. My goodness. Right? And you start to feel loved and you start to know the love of God. Now, you, have you guys, I'm sure you guys have, have, have some understanding, if you haven't already read in Genesis, where, where, where God takes Adam to all the animals, and he's naming all the animals. You guys remember that in Genesis, where Adam's naming the animals? Well, listen, it wasn't just so that they could have a fun time together, and let's see what Adam will name the animals. It wasn't just like, well, Adam has dominion of the earth. And because he has dominion and authority, he's the one naming everything. There's a much deeper truth going on there, and you find out at the end of it what was actually going on there when Adam was doing that, because at the end of all that, it says, and Adam didn't find anyone that was like himself. And so the whole point of Adam going through creation and naming things is Adam was looking for someone he could share his life with, right? Someone that could understand him someone that could see into his heart, that could know his heart on account of being able to feel what was in his heart. We were talking today about, uh, John said, well, did you feel, Greg? And you were like, what? What does that mean? Yeah. Right? Well, through the course of me preaching, you will feel what's in my heart because you will see what I'm excited about. And you can even partake with me in what's going on in my heart. And so Adam went through all of creation. It's like there's nothing that can feel what I'm feeling. There's nothing that can feel the, the love or the joy or the excitement in my heart and share in it with me. There's no one I can talk to about this kind of a thing, right? There's no one that I can rejoice with and dance with and say, isn't it awesome? And know that they know what I'm feeling. I mean, I love my little dogs. My little dogs are great. And I love playing with them. And they can get excited. And they, they can smile. But my, I can't talk to my dogs about the stuff that I'm going through or feel. I can talk, but they don't know. And when I talk to my little, one little dog, Liza Jane, about things, because I do, I talk to them. You know what she does? <laughs> she turns her head all funny, like, what are you saying, man? I don't get it. And even like my dogs, my wife and I talk all the time. Man, I wish they could talk sometimes so we could know what they feel, right? And so Adam went through all of creation, and there was nothing like that for him, right? And then... He's put into a deep sleep. And when he's put into a deep sleep, out of his side, out of one of his ribs, God brings forth Eve. And he looks at Eve and he says, this is flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. Now he sees someone that's like him, right? Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone means my kind. This is a person that is exactly like me in my image in my likeness that can feel the same things I feel. They also live from the heart. They can be influenced. They can feel love. They can feel joy. I can share life with them. I can talk to them about how the grass feels on my feet and on my hands. I could talk to them about how much I love this fruit. I could talk to them about isn't the water nice and the stars, doesn't it sparkle? I can talk to them about the warmth I feel on my skin from the sun and they can share with me in that excitement, right? That's a woman. You know, in the States, they say, whoa, man, <laughs> right? It changed real quickly, right, after Adam planted death in the earth. <laughs> it's that woman you gave me. <laughs> so he goes from whoa, man, to it's that woman you gave me. Now, the woman's not the one that planted death in the earth, right? I try to tell men that all the time, right? Adam, the, Adam's the one that planted death in the earth. Now, all that stuff about Adam, it's not just about Adam, and it's not just about Eve. It's trying to tell us something about God. Paul says in Romans 1 that God uses the visible things of creation to declare the invisible things of himself. Okay? So that story about Adam and Eve really happened. And you can look at them and see things about them through that. But God's trying to declare something about himself through that. Right? And for most of my Christian life, I never even saw that in the scriptures. And then one day, there's lots of casinos where I'm from. And the casinos aren't just like a place where you gamble. They have many restaurants and concerts and buffets and, and all these different kinds of things and, and luxurious hotels. So Becky and I will go stay sometimes at one of these casinos because it overlooks the water. 
And she was getting a nap, and I thought, I'm going to go walk down to the, the beach and look at the beach. And I'm walking through the casino hall, you know, just having a good time. And all of a sudden, on the speakers in the casino, I hear a Queen song. Find me somebody to love. Find me somebody to love. Find. And, you, you know, that's a catchy tune. I don't know about here, but in the States, right, they always play that on the radio, and you can't help but singing it. So I'm just singing it innocently, daydreaming, la, 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 la. And all of a sudden, I hear God. That's what I was singing when I was making creation. And I was like, what? And then I'm grappling, trying to understand it, right? Because I'm like, well, where? where? And then he, he takes me to Adam and Eve. Adam was looking for someone that he could love. And that in him loving them so much, they could feel love back. And so God showed me part of his life when he was making creation through Adam, which is one of the things that God's trying to do. He's trying to tell us something about himself through Adam. So if you look in creation, mankind was the last thing God made. Why didn't he make anything after us? These are just some of the things that I think about. Why didn't he make anything after us? And why didn't he stop with the trees? Why didn't he stop with the water? Why didn't he stop with the angels? I mean, there's a lot of humans that even think the angels are more beautiful than, than, than man. I mean, when we were Catholics, when I was a little boy, I mean, every time someone went home to be with the Lord, they would say, well, God needed another angel. As if it was somehow a step up in the evolutionary chart if you could be an angel. But the Bible says that the angels desire to look into the things that God has given to man. Right? And so God could have stopped after he made the angels, but he didn't. He could have stopped after he made the stars and the galaxies and the universe and the moon and the sun. He could have stopped. But after each one of those things that he made, they didn't quite do it for him. They didn't satisfy his desire. They didn't bring forth rest in his heart. He saw that this isn't like me. I can't really share life with the angels, even as great as they are. They're not my kind. They're just part of me, but they're not all of me. And so I can't share life with them. The trees are nice, but I'm looking for somebody to love. He makes the trees. Find me somebody to love. He makes the sun. And nothing is doing it for him, just like Adam. He went, Adam went through all of creation and didn't find anything that could satisfy his desire for someone to share life with. And that's what's going on in creation. God's going through everything and he can't find, he didn't find anything that satisfied his desire for friendship, for love, for companionship, for sharing his life with. He didn't find anyone that he could empty himself for, that he could serve with his love, that he could spend all his days loving with all of his heart and all of his soul, that could actually feel it the way he would feel it and actually find that love pouring out of them back towards God. No one, he didn't find anybody like that. Just like Adam didn't find anything like that till Eve came out of Adam's side. And then Adam's desire was satisfied in Eve. And now God's using that example to try to teach us something about himself because he's invisible to the natural eyes. And we can't see his life. We don't see his story. And now he's trying to tell us his story, his life through those things so we can know him. Right? We read, in the beginning was God. And God created the heavens and the earth. Do you notice how it can sound kind of stoic? And like it's void of emotion? But John would come and say in chapter 3 that God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. And so now all of a sudden we see a deep emotion that John's describing about God towards mankind, right? Well, John begins his gospel the same way Genesis begins with, in the beginning. Right? John begins with, in the beginning. And so there's a deep emotion in God's heart when he's making creation. He wants somebody to share his life with. He wants somebody to empty himself for. He wants somebody he can love for all his days. That he can spend all his days loving them with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his strength. Well, I know what that feels like because that's what I was looking for. And then I saw Becky, right? And Becky come walking down the stairs, and it was like slow motion. I, you think I'm joking. I'm serious. <laughs> and like there was like wind in her hair. And there was no wind in there. We were in an office, right? 
And it's like I could even hear music, right? Just like God, find me some. Man, you know what I heard? Who's that lady? <laughs> right? Wow. Whoa, man. You see, and at the time, I had been, you know, by myself. I moved away from, from home all the way to Colorado by myself. I hadn't been involved with anybody for like four years, right? Because I was just like, no, I'm going to hang out with me and God and, and let him sort some stuff out in me, right? But then I see Becky, and I see, man, she's my kind. And I found my rest, right, in her because I thought, man, I can spend all my days loving this woman with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength. Man, I find something in me where I want to lay down my life for this woman. I wasn't thinking about what Becky could give me or what Becky could do for me. I was thinking, I got to convince this woman of what I can do for her, right? I, I got to convince this woman of what I can do for her so that when I get down on one knee in adoration of her and propose to her that she join up her life with me and we become one, that she would find something in her heart when she said, amen. Yes, I want to be joined together with you in your life, right? Well, this is what these things that we experience with each other. Why do you think we even experience them with each other? We're the image of God. The reason why I could even have that feeling about Becky is because God first had that feeling about all of us. That's what he felt when he went through all of creation and he didn't see anything. And then he sees he makes man. And that's why he doesn't make anything after he makes man. Do you know why? Because he found his rest in what he saw in man. He said, ah, this is my kind, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. This is my very image. This is the kind of being that can fully experience my love and my peace and my joy. This is the kind of being I can give birth to myself in that I could pour myself out for them and love them with everything I got that when I did, they could feel what I feel. And then we could talk about it and we could end in this wonderful embrace and talk about this wonderful life called love, right? And that's what makes God feel loved. You see, God also wants to be loved, except he's not looking at wanting to be loved from uh, insecurity or lack, right? But he also wants to be able to enjoy a love relationship with people. Well, God doesn't feel loved by what you can do for him. He doesn't. Do you know what makes God feel loved? It makes God feel loved when he sees that people are knowing his love. When people are actually experiencing his love is when he gets a big smile on his face. That's when he feels love. Herein is love, not that you love God, but that God loves you, right? And what bothers God the most, and it's not a disappointment with you, but it's a grief because he wants you to experience his love, is when he thinks you're not experiencing his love. And, you know, we see that in men and women. My wife does a lot of things for me. She really does, right? It's, it's not easy sometimes being in ministry, right? And Becky and I, we lived off in Colorado away from our family, and it was just her and I. And we worked at the same company, and it's just her and I. And so all we had was each other. And so we spent every waking moment together. Well, then we move off into ministry, and, you know, she don't have much of my time anymore. And it isn't because feelings have changed, but it's like there's a lot of different things pulling on my life. And she has to share me with a lot of different people, right? And so she does a lot of things for me. I appreciate all the things she does for me, but none of those things make me feel loved. Do you know what makes me feel loved? When Becky sees that I love her. That's when I feel loved. Because everything I think about is wanting her to know that I love her wanting her to know that I lay down my life for her, right? Wanting her to know that everywhere I go, I think about her. Everywhere I go, my imagination is filled with her. You can go back and listen to every single message I preach over the last 18 days, which I've preached like 14 messages. Every single one of them, Becky's in there. Every single one. And so when I feel loved is when I see on her face that she knows I adore her, that she knows she's the apple of my eye. And it's the same way with God, right? So Isaiah says, where is the heaven is God's throne and the earth is his footstool, but where is the place where he finds his rest? And then it says man. Man is the place where he finds his rest. Man is the place where his heart is. It says home is where your heart is. And so when God saw man, his heart was immediately with him because he saw man is his home. And he saw that, you know what? 
It feels just right when I'm with them and they're leaning on me and I'm leaning on them. They're leaning in my bosom and I'm resting my arm on them. And that's why when he got to man, he says that he barocked man. He blessed man. Well, we just gloss over that topically. Okay, that's nice. He blessed him. We say the blessing. These words have been stripped of their power. We just say them nonchalantly. Let's say grace. <laughs> and then grace is just like a thing you say before you eat, right? And it, you're not realizing the depth of what grace is, right? So like when I write people back, I just wrote this dear sister that uh, she lives in Germany and she was going to try to come here, but something came up at her work so she couldn't come, so she messaged me. And I'm writing her and at the end of it, I just said blessing. It's just like a salutation. We just like sincerely right? In love. And we just write it. We just write it because it sounds nice, right? But when he, the Genesis says that when God saw man, he blessed Adam, he blessed man. When you look at that word in the Hebrew, the Hebrew word is barak. And what it means is that he got down on one knee in adoration. What do we do when we propose? We get down on one knee in adoration, and so the scripture is recording God finding man, seeing man, finding his rest in man. This is what I was after when I began creation. This is what my heart was pulsating for. This was the dream I had in my heart for my life, that there could be someone just like this. And now he's thinking, you know, because when I propose to Becky, I'm not thinking that I want Becky to just be married me, to me for 10 years. I'm not thinking, well, I'll be happy if I get five years out of her. No, <laughs> I know Becky wants me, wants her to go before me. She does, because she doesn't want to think about trying to be without me. And I tell her, well, God, I promise you, whatever you think you get from me, God will be for you, whatever you think you can get from me, right? And we will spend all eternity hanging out together. But I was thinking that I need to be married to Becky for as long as I live, right? Well, when God proposed to Adam, that's what he was thinking. When he got down on one knee to man, that's what he's thinking. He's thinking, I don't just want them for 10 years or 20 years or 40 years or 50 years or 60 years or 80 years. Actually, we're thinking we want them for eternity. That's why we can even feel upset, right, if we lose a loved one. Because 50 years ain't enough. Why do we even feel like 50 years ain't enough? Why do we feel like 60 years ain't enough, 70 years ain't enough, 80 years ain't enough, 100 years is not enough? I don't care how many years you think you could have with somebody in this earth, it would never be enough. Do you know why? Because you want eternity. Do you know why you want eternity? Because God wants eternity. And so when God saw Adam, he's not thinking, I need 100 years, 200 years. He's thinking, I need all eternity to really enjoy this, <laughs> right? That's what I need all of eternity. This is such a beautiful creature. I see myself in their face. Man, I see they can really give expression to all that I am. I can really experience life with them. I can really share life with them. And in fact, the life I can share with them, the life I can experience with them is so amazing. It's so full of love that 100 years ain't going to do. It has to be for all eternity. And then he gets down on one knee with that in mind, right? And his face shines in adoration. Why do you even think we get down on one knee? It's an interesting story. John, you like history. If you trace back the meanings of lots of different things we do, it can become very interesting when you find out their origin, right? Where these sayings come from. But the reason we even get down on one knee is because God first got down on one knee. It's been well written into the chrono, chrono the, what do I want to say? I don't know if it's the analogs. I don't know if that's the right word. But it's well written within the history of mankind that God got down on one knee. The oral tradition of the Jewish people would have recorded God getting down on one knee to Adam, proposing to Adam. And do you know what he's saying to Adam? You are the apple of my eye. And do you know what he's promising Adam? I will decorate you in the fruit of my life. When, it, when God says to Adam, be fruitful and multiply, it's not like it sounds in the English. God isn't telling Adam to go be fruitful. God's promising Adam that he will make him fruitful when you look in the Hebrew. It sounds more like, I promise you, I will decorate you in my life. And in ancient Hebrew, when you propose to a woman, one of the things you do is you would say to them, I'm going to spread my skirt over you, meaning you're going to be decorated in my life. It's called a chupa. 
That's the skirt. And they would spread this thing. And the husband was declaring that I will clothe you in my life. I will be your provision for life. I promise you all the days of my life, I will spend loving you to the point that you'll be clothed even in glory and beauty, which is exactly what God says in Ezekiel. He says he walked by us when we were in our blood. That means when we were dead in sin. And he says, behold, it's the time of love. And I spread my skirt over you, God says. That's the same thing he promised Adam in the beginning. I will decorate you in the fruit of my life. I will spend all my days loving you with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my strength. Because when I look at you, I feel that you are my home. This is the place I call my home. I, in this natural world, to use a natural example, I can go a lot of places. I feel very at home with you all. I really do. I like being here with you all. You all don't just feel like, well, these are some people that I'm going to sit with and talk about the Bible. <laughs> right? And I felt that even before I came here. Right? And that's why I said yes so quickly. And, and so home for me is wherever Becky is. We can live anywhere. Right? We can be anywhere. If she's there, that's home. If I'm there, that's home. Now that's just a, allow me the poverty of that example because really what the only thing that's really home for us is God. Mm-hmm. Right? And for him, we're the only thing that's really home for him, right? And so, man, he's trying to show us that his heart is with us. We're his home. We're the place he finds comfort. We're the place that he finds that everything is just right. Everything's nice. And he's that way for us. And he's trying to show us that, right? You ever had that feeling where, ah, everything is just right? You ever had that feeling? We all know that feeling, don't don't we? Why can we even have that feeling? You notice how I said that and every single one of you knows what I'm talking about? Why can we even feel that way? Because that's how God felt when he saw us. Everything is just right. It's a nice feeling. When I lived in Colorado, I did a lot of snowboarding because I thought if I'm in the mountains and I'm up here by myself, I'm going to get a pass to Vail and I'm just going to snowboard all the time. Right, and so you go up to Vail, and you're way up at eleven thousand feet, and you're snowing, snowboarding out of bounds, and it's nice, but it's hard on your legs. Like you can become sore. But when you get down from the mountain and you're done snowboarding that day, you go back to your your condo, and there's a hot tub outside, right? And the hot tub's outside, right? And then it can be like snowing these big gigantic snowflakes that you can watch them, and they're just falling slowly and softly and the air can be cold but that water that water is hot and you go and get in that water and you're in the water and it's nice for your sore legs but then you still feel the snowflakes falling on you softly and you can't help but have this feeling come over you that's nice everything is just right 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 that's how god felt you see we we're closer to God than we can ever really imagine. It's just we've never really thought of this is how God feels. So we just think of it as our feeling. And it leaves us with this disconnect in our experiencing of God and our intimacy with God and seeing how closely related we really are with God. And the things we feel, the things we see, the things we experience, the reason why we even feel them that way, the reason why we would even describe them that way, the reason why we would even want to experience them that way is because God did. And then we see it in God, right? Hmm. You're going to see God's face shining in adoration when he saw Adam getting down on one knee and what he felt. And everybody can think about having that feeling themselves. And you, that's what God felt. Oh, we can watch movies about, I mean, little girls grow up reading, you know, I don't know if you guys have that here, but in the States, little girls grow up watching like fairy tales, Prince Charming, Mm -hmm. right? And as a little girl, how do you feel when you see Prince Charming and what you can find if you find Prince Charming? And then you deal with the heartbreak of realizing no man can be Prince Charming. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, well, Prince Charming is true, but that's God. Right? God is your Prince Charming. And better you find that out now that no man can be your Prince Charming because that will allow you to actually enjoy a relationship with your 
your husband or your boyfriend because you won't have a heavy burden on him trying to get him to be Prince Charming. You realize, no, God's my Prince Charming. God makes me whole, and out of wholeness, now I can dwell with this man. And now I'm not looking for this man to be to me what only God can be. And I'm setting this man free from a heavy yoke of bondage. And you want the man to also see that, right? Where he's not looking to the woman in order to satisfy all of his needs, but he's looking to God, and now he's just sharing life with the woman. Right? We put a heavy yoke on relationships in this world that makes it nearly impossible. That's why we see divorce rates so high. That's why we see relationships becoming more and more heavy. More and more people don't want to get married. They don't want to get married because look at all the divorce. Why do I want to get married if I'm going to get divorced? Who wants to go through all this pain? It's because our idea of marriage has been shaped by the world, where we're busy trying to find things from a partner that you can only find in God. Right? And you're, you get upset with the person when they can't be God right? Every time you don't feel your needs met, you're upset with them. But they can't meet your needs because they're also needing their needs to be met because they're not God. And then you cannibalize one another. You blame one another for the emptiness you feel because after all, Prince Charming, right? And even in the beginning of a relationship, you can feel so happy that you found them. You can feel like they're the ones that made you whole. And then as the relationship wears on, you could start to feel not as exuberant. You start dwelling with them and you think, you know what? The way they snore, that kind of bothers me. <laughs> you can have all these funny kinds of things. And we call it in the States, oh, the newness has worn off. Oh, yeah. Right? It's not that the newness has worn off. It's that you're looking at, to a person for what you can only get from God. And it's robbing you the joy of appreciating their idiosyncrasies and just laughing about it. I remember... Becky and I had that kind of thing when we found each other. It was like, it was like, ha, ah! you know, it's like the clouds opened, you hear angels singing, and it was like, I mean, there was even times where we would come out of, because she worked in the same office building, and we would come out of the office building, we didn't know each other, and we'd be whistling the same song, and we'd be like, what? And so you, you we experienced that kind of a thing, and we were deceived into thinking that we would make each other whole because we thought we kind of felt it. And then we went through a whole period where things would go wrong. And, you know, we could be triggered and we could get upset and think the other one failed us. And we would blame each other for the lack that we felt. Got to the point where I was busy telling this woman, just like Adam, <laughs> this woman. And he said something so shocking to me. That God speaks to me radically because I'm stiff-necked, right? When I get it, no one can move me, and I can open it up and open it up and open it up. But until I'm, I get it, I'm stiff-necked. And so he has to say things radically to me to really draw the line so I can see what I'm actually doing. And he's not rude, but he just shows me what it really is. And so I'm busy, this woman, look at this, look at that. And he said, Greg, you know why you're upset with Becky? You know why you're upset with her? And I was like, yes, I I was like, yes, I'm pretty sure I know why I'm upset. He said, I don't think you do. The reason you're upset with her is because she can't be God. And I just stopped. And I realized I was holding her to the standard of life giver. I was holding her to the standard of peace provider, joy provider, love provider. And so the moment I didn't feel peace or love and joy, do you know who my heart blamed? Her. And I was holding her to an account. And I was keeping a record of her wrongs because of it. Right? I had a, look what she did here. Right? And the moment I saw that I was, that she, that I didn't, you don't do it on purpose. It's not like you go over in the corner and plan out how you're going to make your spouse your God. But the world teaches you to, to live that way. Right. The second I saw that, I realized, yeah, I mean, she had gotten exalted into my heart as if she was the one that completes me. You even have Jer the Jerry Maguire movie. Any of you guys ever seen Jerry Maguire? And they play that nice song to make it all romanticized. And he says, you complete me. And so the world promotes that kind of thing. And that's what destroys relationships. I'm from the southern part of the United States. And there's a, a southern we have these funny sayings. Right? We can be kind of like redneck. I don't know if that word mean, means anything to you all, but we're country. Well, this, this friend of mine, we talk about this a lot, and he does a lot of marriage counseling also like I do. 
and he says, you know what it's like when, we, when I explain this to him? It's like two ticks and no dog. <laughs> <laughs> so a, a tick sucks life and blood out of the dog. But if you have two ticks and no dog, they're trying to suck life and blood out of each other. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and it's a heavy thing to put on relationships. And I don't know why I went into any of that about relationships, but maybe it can just be, be good um, for people. So this was God. This is, this is what God's feeling in his life when he's making creation. This is what he's thinking about. And now he feels real happy. He finds Adam. Right? But there's a middle part of the story that isn't so nice for God. And the middle part of the story is when Adam goes and eats from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and now that tree gets it right to produce death in him. And death in the earth. Well, God's got a real big problem in his heart now because he wouldn't be happy with only being able to walk with Adam for a thousand years. He wants to be with Adam for all eternity, but now the place where he finds his rest, that Man, that woman, Adam and Eve, they're now dying. They're now perishing. And so God's like heartbroken. We feel heartbroken when we lose somebody, don't we? Do you know why we feel heartbroken? Because God felt heartbroken. You see, and it's not nice to feel heartbroken ever. It's never nice to feel heartbroken, right? But when we feel heartbroken, many times we can look for a support group. You know how, there's, you know how many support groups there are in the world? And what are support groups? You try and find a group of people that you think know what you're going through. And in them knowing what you're going through, you think you're going to find some comfort. You think you're going to find some goodness. You think you're going to find some understanding, some compassion that's going to help you get through it. Well, listen, that's God. God's our support group. And when we feel brokenhearted over the loss of a loved one, that's what God felt. And the only reason why we even feel that is because God first felt it. And when you're heartbroken and you're experiencing that sorrow and you're intimately acquainted with that feeling and you're now also connecting, this is exactly what God felt? Oh, my goodness. And you begin knowing God by looking into the depth of his heart, into the depth of his being. And you get caught up in this intimacy with God. And then now God becomes your support group. And you get drawn into this intimacy with him where you find yourself talking with him about what you're going through. And you find you're able to pour your heart out because you see he's gone through it. He knows. Because we don't want to talk to somebody that we don't think they know. In the States, we say, try walking a mile in my shoes and then come and tell me about it. We have seminary schools in the States where you go to learn uh, the Bible and now you can go be a preacher. Well, they ship all those Bible college students down to the French Quarter in Bourbon Street so they can practice ministry on people <laughs> because that's where you're going to find all the sinners, <laughs> right, that need to be converted. And the same guy that says the story about the two ticks and no dog, they bust him down there when he was a young guy. He's a kind, sensitive man that loved the Lord, but the, he didn't know any better. This is what they told you you do if you love the Lord. Mm -hmm. So he goes, and he's trying to do the right thing. And he goes and finds this homeless guy that is struggling with alcoholism, that is just, you know, basically laid out on the road down on Bourbon Street. Well, my friend Jim goes and sits next to the guy, starts trying to witness <laughs> to the guy. <laughs> And poor Jim, man, that guy just cussed at him. And I'll leave out the expletives, but he basically told Jim, come and live with me for a week and then tell me about my life. You see, he didn't want to hear anything from Jim unless Jim knew what hurt him. And we don't want to hear from anybody unless we think they know what's hurting us. You, what's interesting about this dynamic is, I just have to say this, mm -hmm. all of us know what hurts each of us. Mm -hmm. Jesus nailed to the cross. Mm -hmm. Is God discerning for every single one of us this, the hurt that we've all felt? We've all felt the same hurt. There might have been different circumstances, but it's the same hurt. And so Jesus come and revealed to all of us, this is the hurt that we've all felt. So when I look at you, Delene, and I think about what hurts you, I, what you've been through in life, 
and what life has tried to do to you. I see what life has tried to do to you by seeing Jesus on the cross. But I also see what life has tried to do to me by seeing Jesus on the cross. And I see the hurt that he was feeling on the cross from the effects of death. And I see the hurt that you felt in this earth from the effects of death. And I see the hurt that I felt from the effects of death. And I can look at you and I can immediately see you know. I can look you in the eye and I can tell you no. And now you and I could be of comfort to one another because in us knowing that we both have been through the same things, we can pour out our hearts to one another and we can receive comfort from one another and we can be comforted with the same comfort wherewith the Lord Jesus was comforted with when he was nailed to a cross, right? And we can find ourselves being comforted by one another. And so the only reason we can have a broken heart over a loss is because God first had a broken heart over the loss of Adam and Eve. Right? We want to keep building on seeing God's life through Adam. Are you guys doing okay? Can I keep going or do you want to stop? Is that too much? We want to, we want to keep building on um, seeing God's life through Adam because it, it reveals a lot of beautiful um, things. You know, the scripture says that Adam wasn't deceived. I used to read over that and just think Adam wasn't deceived. We read the scriptures like that. We just quickly gloss over things. Adam wasn't deceived. Adam wasn't deceived. It doesn't mean anything. Who cares? I'm not going to spend days and weeks and months and years thinking about what that means. Who cares? And then God started showing me something about that. Well, why would Adam eat from the tree if he wasn't deceived? I don't think we realize it, but we assume he was just deceived. And that's why he did it. But then the scripture specifically says Adam was not deceived. Right? So then I started asking God, well, if Adam wasn't deceived, why did he eat from the tree? He said, Greg, do you know why Adam ate from the tree when he wasn't deceived? Because the thought, he knew Eve ate from the tree. And the thought that Eve would die, the thought that Eve would be alone in outer darkness, that she would be sitting in the dark alone, afraid, scared, suffering, tormented, was too much for him to handle. And he felt something inside of himself that we've all felt this way too. I'd rather die than let that happen. Even the thought of death becomes the kind of thought that sounds better than thinking about the one that I looked at that said that's flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. That's the one that I found my rest in, the one that I wanted to share my life with for all my days, the one I wanted to pour myself out with for all my days. The thought of them now being in outer darkness, feeling alone and scared and afraid and tormented by fear. I know what that kind of a thing can feel like. I'd rather die with them than let them be dying alone and think they're all alone. So now Adam goes and eats from the tree also. He's not deceived. He enters into her darkness to be with her because he'd rather be with her in the darkness than have her be there alone. Now, I understand that kind of a thing. You see, and God started showing me, Greg, you know exactly what that's like. And God's like a setup man, right? It's like checkmate. You don't know exactly what he's doing. You're just tracking along with him innocently. And next thing you know, checkmate. Bam. So he starts, he starts catching me up in this kind of a thought. And you can see I'm already feeling it just thinking about Adam. And he starts telling me, Greg, imagine you coming home one night. You guys have to bear with me if I get emotional. I don't mean to, but for some reason I just do. So just forgive me in advance. He says, Greg, imagine you coming home one night from New Orleans, from a Bible study. And you, you come in, you know, and you're turning to go down your street. And imagine as you're about to go down your street, you start to see lights, police lights, fire lights. And you, you can't make out where they're at yet, but you see they're there. And, you know, you're getting closer to where your street is to turn down. And you see they're all in front of your house. And you see your house is on fire, right? And so you jump out of your house and you run up to the, the, the barricade because that's what they do. They'll set up like a barricade, right? You'll have the firefighters. You have the police officers. It says, imagine, Greg, you see that none of the firefighters are in there and none of the police officers are in there. And you go running to try to get through the thing, to try and get close to the house. And they're stopping you and telling you there's nothing that can be done. You can't go in there. And you find out Becky's in there still. 
And now she's all alone somewhere in that house thinking that no one's there. She's all by herself. The flames are encroaching on her. And you're imagining the fear, the loneliness, how scared she might be. And I promise you, in that moment, I don't care if I'm going to get burned up. I'm not deceived. I know I'm going to get burned up. I tell you what, a hundred people couldn't keep me from getting in there just so I could look her in the face and be with her in that place so she knew she wasn't alone, so I could hold her. We all know what that feels like. Even though I, as I'm describing, we're all, yeah, yeah. And then God says, Greg, that was me. That was me when man went in the darkness. You see, Jesus wasn't deceived. Jesus knew what was coming when he came into the earth. He knew the tree we ate from. He knew the death that it manifested in us. But there was something in Jesus, like what I just described that was in me, where he couldn't stand the thought of us being alone and afraid and in the darkness and thinking that he wasn't there, that we weren't loved, and that we were just perishing. He couldn't stand that thought. So he came and ate from the tree too. He partook of the death with us. Because he'd rather die with us then think of us dying alone. We're God's Eve. The account of Adam and Eve, the reason why there's even an account of Adam and Eve is because we're God's Eve. It says that Eve was taken out of the side of Adam. Well, there's Jesus on the cross. Adam was put into a deep sleep. There's Jesus on the cross going into a deep sleep, even our death, and they stick him in the side with the spear, don't they? And out of his side, do you know who comes forth? Us. The church. (laughs) You see, if I get into the house with Becky, I, I, I can't save her. Because I'm a man. I can only be there with her. I'm not God. I can only hold her tight and tell her it's going to be okay. right? But Jesus doesn't just come into our darkness and hold us tight and say it's going to be okay. He does do all of that. But there's another kind of a comfort that comes forth from him. Because out of his side, he can bring forth us anew. Out of the death. And he can bring forth his Eve out of the death that she was in. right? Because he's the last Adam. And out of his side can come forth his Eve, right? Out of the darkness. He can bring us forth out of the darkness. He doesn't just enter in to be with us in the darkness. He enters in to bring us forth out of the darkness, right? See, we all know what that feels like. All of us know these feelings. These are not foreign feelings to us, but we don't connect them with God. And we read the Bible And we read all these things and we make all of our fancy doctrines. And we feel real good about our doctrines. We have Romans Road and we teach Alpha. And we say all these fancy things about what we need to do because we're all sinners. We don't understand what it means to be a sinner. We we think it's it's a word about our identity. We think it's a word about what God feels about us. I mean, to be a sinner just means that you're in a state of death and you're dying. That's what the word means, the state of one who is dying, not partaking of life, having missed the mark God had for their life. The mark God had for their life is that they would live and not die. The mark God had for their life is that he could spend all his days loving them. And now we've missed that mark. We're dying. But we got all of our doctrines in a fancy little bow. All the while, none of those doctrines are causing us to know God. We know God better in what we feel than we could have ever felt through our doctrine. We just hadn't let the Holy Spirit show us why we feel these things and let them connect the things we feel to God himself. And then we say, oh my goodness. And then you start feeling close with God like he intended, right? And you start walking with God in the cool of the day. And you start letting God tend to the garden of your heart because you see he knows he really knows, right? And you feel intimately acquainted with God. And you know he's intimately acquainted with you, right? We all have an easy time talking to somebody that we think is like us. We come right out of our shell, don't we? Right? We feel safe, comfortable, unjudged. They know. That's, you can't have that better than with anyone. But God's the person you can have that the best way with. 
and all of our doctrines have created a bunch of nonsense about it. Our doctrines are only so good that they reveal the heart of God. Jesus is the Word made flesh, and it says the reason why He was made flesh was to reveal the heart of God. It says he was in the bosom of the Father. He hath come into the earth to declare the heart of God. Jesus is God plopping his heart out on the table so we could see these kinds of things in there and we could feel embraced and loved and cared for and understood. And then you start to understand yourself better when you see, oh God, yeah, God feels that way. Right? The Bible is more like a work of art than it is a mathematical equation. And Western theology particularly has made the Bible and scriptures more like a mathematical equation where we've chopped them up into individual verses and we try to pull out doctrines out of individual verses instead of seeing that each verse is much more like a brush stroke that an artist would use to paint on a canvas and that each brushstroke is trying to create a gigantic picture. And the picture it's trying to create is God and the heart of God. And that's what the Bible is there for. It's for a master artist to come and paint this picture of God where you could see God clearly. It's like a puzzle. And it puts together this puzzle. And after you, the puzzle's put together and you see the picture, you see God. Right? And then... You're beholding God. That's what it's supposed to do. You behold the love of God. Right? Does that make sense? Well, glory to God. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. I'll just pray for everybody, for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you guys will allow me that, um, I don't want to force it on you, but I'll just pray and then we can do whatever anybody feels like. I can pray for people. We cannot pray for people. We can just hang out and talk, whatever. Um, Thank you, Father, that you desire to be known and that you see that if we could just see into your heart clearly, that it would heal us, that it would heal all of our hurts, that it would heal all of our pains, that it would heal all of our confusion. Thank you for drawing near to us and showing us yourself in Jesus, Lord. Thank you that you've even given that we can know you intimately like this. Thank you that you're not a faraway God, you're not a distant God, but that you're personal, that you're tangible, and that we could actually know you the way we could know another person by seeing into their heart. Thank you for plopping your heart out on the table. Thank you for coming and partaking with us in our death when you knew what would happen. Thank you for showing us that you'd rather take our death into yourself than let us die. Thank you, Lord, for showing us the things that we feel. We feel them because you first felt them. Thank you, Lord, for catching us up in this beautiful dance with you where we're able to share our hearts with you on the deepest level. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you guys so much. Thank you guys so much. Mm.